It's, it's well known that you should never speak after an astronaut. <laughs> There's nothing that you can possibly say that compares with uh, launching into space on a river of liquid fire, but I'm going to try. Um, I am a glass blower. I'll uh, start by saying that glass is an alchemic blend of sand and metallic oxides combined with extraordinary blinding heat. The result is a material that flows and drips like honey. When it's hot, glass is alive. It moves gracefully and inexorably in response to gravity and centripetal force. It possesses an inner light and transcendent radiant heat that make it simultaneously one of the most fascinating and one of the most technically challenging materials for an artist to work with. Glass can have an unbelievable range of color. It's, over the years, I've developed many different colors, but it's the most unusual material because even its edges and shadows have color. I started to blow glass more than 50 years ago when I left college and I rented 50 acres of land, sewed together a, a teepee in northern Vermont, and constructed a ram ramshackle studio to live in, or to work in. Completely used uh, recycled materials. Today, um, today, my studio is much more modern. And when I moved here to western Massachusetts, I found some old, I, I took it as a, a good omen when I found old marbles floating, or not floating, but in the, in the gardens outside my kitchen. And when I took those old marbles into the, into the house and washed them off, they were just as bright and beautiful as they were on the day they went missing, maybe 70 years before when kids were called in for dinner. Those little marbles made me think about the longevity of glass and how, if left undisturbed, glass can last for hundreds or even thousands of years and the first week that I was in town in Shelburne Falls, one of the local school teachers stopped by and asked me if I'd be willing to demonstrate glass blowing to all the local school kids in the county. And I readily agreed, not realizing that there were actually zillions of eighth graders <laughs> in, in the county. And so I had inadvertently agreed to having as many as 50 kids in my studio every Wednesday afternoon for literally for months. And so I, I started by showing them, actually, have, have, have any of you ever known or met an eighth grader? <laughs> These are people who will suffer no, no boredom whatsoever in their lives. And when I began to show them, they, they had no interest at all in watching me make vases or, or bowls or bottles or paperweights, but they loved it when I began to make marbles for them. Cat's eyes and swirly marbles but one night, after months of doing this, I, I thought about the picture that Bill Anders had taken of our Earth uh, only a few years before this. And, and I thought about how our Earth looks like a little blue marble floating in the black void of space. And so the next day, instead of making marbles, I made planets for these kids, little worlds which allowed me to explain the mechanics of glassmaking, but also allowed me to let them think about how small, how infinitesimal our world that seems so vast and limitless is when compared with the universe. And, and I, I really hoped that these little spheres would give them something to explore and something to think about. Planets, um, when I started making these, they, they really started me off making work about space and cosmology. And these little spheres are simple. They're simple, but they are meant to be explored. And everybody gets it. They're, they're, they, whether, it doesn't matter whether you're old or young or it doesn't, they don't care about gender, they don't care about ethnicity. They don't care about religion. 
planets are understood by everyone around the world. And, and so what I'm actually going to do, though, oh, and actually, they could even be understood by different species, I think. So today, my work is in museums around the world. Um, and, but I actually want to tell you a story, a little story about this little goblet. And along the way, while I'm telling you that story, I, I'll, I'll show some pictures of my, of my work and, and what I'm doing currently. This looks like it could be a drinking goblet, but it's actually only about an inch and a half. Some of them are two inches tall. And throughout the 17th and 18th century, archaeologists around the world were completely stumped by what these things were. They didn't know whether they were uh, meant for religious ceremonies or perhaps for uh, unguents or, or salves or medicinal reasons. They, had, they really had no idea. They had so many theories, whether maybe they were used for makeup or, or, uh, or ethereal oils. It was a huge debate, but nobody had the answer. But then, in 1973, one of my friends, a research scientist at Corning Museum of Glass, was in Herat, Afghanistan, and discovered a glassmaker making one of these little goblets. And he excitedly asked about it, and the, the glass blower didn't even answer him, answer him. He just pointed up at a bird cage. And there, in that glass studio, was a, uh, caged birds with two of these little goblets, one for seed and one for water. And of course, it made sense suddenly that all throughout the Middle East, people had kept caged birds. But now, the cages were, of course, all gone. But the little goblets remained. And I love that story. I love the fact that arche ar archaeologists had got it wrong for so long. And I also realized that, that most ancient glass in museums and around the world, in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris or Prague or, or in New York, the ancient glass was not kept by collectors and preserved in galleries. It was dug up by archaeologists. And so I thought to myself, at the time, my glass, no one was collecting my glass, and no museums had my glass. And I thought, you know, Maybe I should try hiding my, these little planets that I was making for kids around the world. And so, at first, I hid them around town, close by in flower pots on the street. Really, they're not signed. They're meant to be a present to give to someone soon or later or 100 years from now or maybe longer. And so I left them in mundane places at first and then later began to sort of explore. And here, there was this river that had carved a great, huge canyon in the United States. And I climbed up the walls there and hid planets. And then, as I had friends who were traveling and going exploring, I'd have them bring along a little planet wherever they were going. And with the hope that they'd hide it in a place where it might be found or might not be found. And so, they began to travel around the world. And and I, but then I began to think, you know, if you really want archaeologists to find these things, you should leave them where archaeologists are likely to go. And so the moats around castles, and sometimes I just literally throw them out into the, in, 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 around the grounds near castles. This is in Ililiset, Greenland, on a grave. This is the confluence of the American and Eurasian tectonic plates in Iceland. And you can see the little, little splash that the planet made there. That's deep water. And I continued to try to have these little planets go further and further around the world. So this is the magnetic North Pole, South Pole. And, and I had a project for years to hide them under water. First, I did them myself. But then later on, Others helped me. This is Henry Kaiser underneath the Antarctic ice. And the Woods Hole Oceanographic folks have helped with their Alvin submarine, bringing planets to the Azores. 
uh, and to the Azores where they're hidden near volcanic vents. And this is uh, Dr. Robert Ballard's uh, remote vehicle. And then, of course, trying to get them to mountains everywhere, K2, Everest, Latsi. And then, once I learned how to fly, it really expanded my ability to hide, hide my work. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little window that I put in, in the wind, window of our plane. And, uh, and so, have you ever tried to break a marble when you were a kid? They're very hard to break, so if you, if you drop them out of the plane, I have high confidence that they will survive. And uh, actually, this is just me taking off. And um, this is uh, Peter Dimandis with, with one of his planets that he hid. And you may recognize this guy. Um, this is at the desk of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky in Russia. Um, there's a planet hidden behind his uh, mirror. And this is me hiding a planet, burying a planet outside the office of the director. I, I realized at some point that if you really want your glass to be a preserved in museums, maybe you should just hide it in museums. And, and, and so this is me hiding a planet outside the office of the director of the Corning Museum of Glass. And uh, this planet was excavated at the museum and identified as the work of Josh Simpson. It is one of the thousands of planets that Simpson has placed around the globe in his infinity project. And, uh, but of course, it's a challenge to have your work go to space as an artist. And, and um, this is my wife, Katie Coleman, with planets in microgravity. And so, here they are.